Are you all ready? Yeah, I'm ready. All right, here you go. Okay. All right, good evening, everyone, and thank you for registering for our program tonight. Tonight's program is a repeat program from one that was uh, rudely interrupted in February. And I wanna thank Phil for graciously offering to do a uh, encore presentation for us, especially for those who were kicked out of the Zoom meeting before and they couldn't get back in. Uh, Phil has uh, researched African-American baseball for more than 35 years. He has written numerous books on the subject and won prestigious uh, Casey Award for the best baseball book of the year. He has appeared on PBS, C-SPAN, BET, Fox Sports, National Public Radio, Sirius XM Radio, and other national broadcast media. He is a co-founder of the Negro League Baseball Museum in Kansas City and currently serves on its advisory board. Uh, he has formerly worked for the Public Relations Office in the Kansas City Royals. Phil is a researcher, an author, historian, and has made it his mission to share his research and extensive baseball uh, knowledge in general. So welcome, Phil, and thank you for doing this presentation uh, for us again. Well, I'm happy to be back and uh, talk about baseball up in Michigan. Um, I've only been, been to Michigan a few times, but it's close to my heart because one of my favorite players, a uh, guy by the name of George Wilson, is from Palmyra, Michigan. So um, I just want to uh, start off by tonight saying that uh, I want to thank the library and thank you, Vicki, for all your patience and everything and making this happen again. So we're going to have a wonderful time tonight. Uh, what I do want to do is um, let people, I'm going to start off with a poem. And uh, when I finish this uh, poem, I'm going to actually go back and interpret what I was thinking as I was preparing this poem. And it really it came from a song that I heard by Janice Ian called Stars. When I heard that song, it prompted some things in my mind. I guess being like the rappers, I decided to sample a little bit of it. So uh, we're going to go back and that's when it started off. So you'll hold the slide right there and then we'll go through it. But the poem goes, it's the name of it is Giants. And the reason I title uh, a lot of my programs, The Giants, is because once upon a time, Black people didn't get their picture in the newspaper. And so to let people know that a game was going to be played between two Black teams, they started to name most of the Black teams the Giants. As a matter of fact, when the Negro League started in 1920, they had the St. Louis Giants and uh, they had the Chicago Giants. And so they had teams with the name Giants in the league. Actually, it was three of them. So anyway, that's the reason why it was it was a um, a name that indicated who you were. And from a generation ago or a couple of generations ago, people knew what that meant. So long story short, we're going to do this poem. And the poem going something like this, Giants, they come fast, they come slow, then disappear like the last light of the sun in segregated America. And all we see is their glory. But it'll be lonely there when people have forgotten and there's no one left to share. After all, none of us are happy these brothers were treated so unfair. You see, some Giants played for fame. They were athletes in a baseball game who tore their rotator cuffs and came up throwing. Some of them were down. Some of them were crowned. Others lost and never found. But most have seen it all. They spend their life on touring buses or crowded cars, barnstorming for glory when there was no one there to write their story. In a town, the name few can recall, one of these giants really slugged the ball. He had three hits, scored four runs, bases stolen four. I'd like to know where I'd like to learn more, but there was no one there to score this game. And for at his shame, the newspapers didn't bother to report his name. Some giants made it when they were young. They played the game for fun in a world that was never ready to accept them. I see it was a dirty job for those who paved the way for every time they lift their eyes and tried to soar. They had to wonder who would be there to bar the door. Some giants had arms of steel. Men would pay to see. So they put it on display. Some had great speed. Even I could watch them run all day. Some excelled at hitting ball with bat and gee, their hitting was advanced. Young boy said I could do that if I had half the chance. I could be a giant like bronze men of age 25, young and alive. Crowds watching as they walked and laughed and asked for memorabilia and autographs in small towns and big cities too. People filled the stands and gave their approval with feet and hands. 
and watch these men play with ball and glove. As young girls uh, smiled and dreamed of their physique and dreamed of kissing them on the cheek, yet these men never could believe you truly loved them. Of course, some giants made it when they were old, like solid gold, after age 40, still playing tricks on father time, throwing baseballs over dimes, using a talent they still could share, a deep down soul they had to bear. Or maybe it wasn't much there, for even they would say, I didn't have much then, but when I was young, you wouldn't let me in. But will we ever know the pain of living with a nickname you never own, Coop Papa, Turkey, Double Duty, or Buck, a nickname on loan that somehow stuck, or the many years of beginning the job you've ever known, life on the road, living away from home, living out of a suitcase, or how about this, being the showcase? These are men whose names will live beyond this day, men who play for the love of the game regardless of the pay. So I hope some of you will remember these black stars, scorned and despised, the original giants, the unrecognized, who came fast, who came slow, then disappeared like the last light of the sun in segregated America. We're going to go to the next slide and start our presentation. I want to dedicate part of this tonight to a gentleman by the name of Ted Raspberry. Ted Raspberry was the last owner of the Kansas City Monarchs, and he was responsible for keeping the Negro Leagues going in the uh, 1960s. And uh, he operated out of Grand Rapids, Michigan. And Ted was a great guy. And uh, some people had a chance to meet Ted. And uh, this is the photograph of Ted and I down in uh, St. Louis, uh, probably about 1990, 91. Uh, he lived to be, uh, he lived to 2001. But most people had never seen Ted Raspberry, and I, I was fortunate enough to take a photograph with him and talk to him about baseball. So I want to dedicate it to him, and I want to dedicate it to someone else. Go to the next slide. I want to dedicate it to Pat Patterson. Pat Patterson, another guy, he was born in Omaha, but he was the first policeman to die in the line of duty in Battle Creek, Michigan. And if you ever get to Battle Creek, Michigan, where W.K. Kellogg and C.W. Post and even Sir Journer Truth, they're all buried in the same cemetery, right along with Pat Patterson. You probably heard of those other people, but after tonight, you'll remember Pat Patterson, outstanding baseball player, a great man. And I had the pleasure of going there with the Kellogg Foundation many years ago and bringing his uh, career to life as well. Go one more slide. Last one I want to dedicate it to one of my favorite players. His name is George Wilson. George Wilson. Uh, was from Palmyra, Michigan. And uh, he was one of the greatest left-handed pitchers that ever lived around the turn of the century. And uh, just so happened uh, years ago, they were tearing down George's house. And I knew the guy who owned it because we were corresponding. And so I said, hey, when you get ready to tear the house down, send me some of the uh, wood from the house. And so I have wood from George Wilson's house that I hope to make a, into a frame. I've been keeping it for 30 years, so... Hopefully this will be the year I get my frame, right? But anyway, outstanding player. He's buried in Palmyra, Michigan. And you can see these are nice photographs of these players. And uh, George Wilson died, I think, about 1918. I th yeah, 1915. So you can imagine this is a beautiful picture from 1915. So I want to – I'm thinking about all these guys if I as I do this program tonight. Go to the next slide. Of course, when I start thinking about the Giants – I started thinking about this guy named uh, Chet Brewer. Chet Brewer was a guy who pitched for the Kansas City Monarchs, outstanding player, born in 1901. And uh, he used to tell me the story about when he was a kid, his foot was partially run over by a trolley car. And so he lost three toes. And so he pitched his entire career, over 25 years, with a handicap on one of his foot feet. And it was the important foot that you stepped down on when you're a pitcher, when, you, when you're when uh, you throwing the ball toward home plate. But he pitched his entire career with a handicap. And I had the pleasure of uh, going out to Los Angeles, California, and spending about three nights with Chet Brewer back in the 80s, 1980s. And uh, so I'm at his house, and uh, we're talking baseball. So what do you think I asked Chet Brewer? I asked Chet Brewer, let me see the foot. So I can't see that I've seen Chet Brewer's foot missing the toes, and I'm sure that that's not something that most people can celebrate, but it's a story that I could tell. And Chad Brewer did a lot for baseball. And the first baseball player I ever met was a gentleman by the name of Reggie Smith. 
And Reggie Smith was trained by Chet Brewer out in Los Angeles. And so it all comes together, the history. Of course, Chet Brewer, uh, he, he died in Los Angeles, but he was from a mount around my area. I live in Kansas City. He was from Leavenworth, Kansas, which is probably about 30 miles from my home where I grew up. Go to the next slide. And you saw he was wearing his giant uniform. And of course, you can't talk about anything related to Michigan without mentioning the Detroit Stars. And the Detroit Stars were organized in 1980, 1918. And uh, they were offshoot of the Negro uh, Baseball League. <clears throat> and Rube Foster uh, was a, able to finance this team when they first started. And of course, he sent his star player, Pete Hill, over to be the manager. And there's Pete Hill in the individual picture. And uh, Teeny Blunt, the guy who's wearing the sweater in the team picture, he was the owner. And my most recent book, which is called The Negro Baseball Leagues, A Photographic History, it's a series. Uh, Pete Hill is one of the stars of that particular book. So know a lot about Pete Hill. And you guys, if you want to know about a great hitter, equal to Ty Cobb and a whole bunch of other people, Napoleon Lajewe, all of those people during that period, you need to know about Pete Hill. So go next slide. <clears throat> And also in the poem, you know, I talk about people tearing their rotator cuffs and came up throwing. I took, I was thinking about Dink Moffel when I was writing this. I met Dink Moffel in 1980. He died about three weeks after we met. And um, he told the lady who was taking care of him, he said, when this guy comes by, give him all my photographs. And he knew he was going to die, didn't have any relatives. And so those photographs were the photographs that really got me started <clears throat> over 40 44 years ago, being an African-American baseball historian. And it's because of this gentleman right here. And his career ended when he tore his rotator cuff in 1934. And I showed up in 1980 and kept it going. Interesting thing, Mr. Mothel, he left his uh, passport. Turns out Mothel was born on August 14th. Actually, August 13th, excuse me, August 13th. And... Uh, What's kind of ironic is when I met Mr. Mr. Mopo, I only knew him for three weeks, but guess what my birthday is? August 13th. And I'm about to be married for 40 years. It'll be 40 years this year. And my wife's birthday, believe it or not, you got, is August 13th. So <laughs> important day. I can't write history, can't talk about history without squeezing Mr. Mopo in there some kind of way. I was thinking about him in that particular phrase in the poem. Go to the next slide. And, of course, when I first started uh, baseball, uh, the first time I put on a uniform, it was for this guy, Sherman Jones. He used to pitch for the New York Mets, and uh, I was able to get big league instruction the first time I put on a uniform, and that's one of the reasons why I really love baseball. You know, he had played for Casey Stingle, and he used to sit around, and he would tell us stories about Casey Stingle. And one of the stories I always liked, he said Casey Stingle had a strategy. He said, he said, the success to being a good manager is keeping the guys who hate you away from the guys who are undecided. And that was Casey Stingle. And of course, uh, that's me as a young guy right there. Uh, I started off uh, collecting baseball cards, but actually it started off in 1964, I was collecting Beatles cards. And uh, I made the mistake of taking them to school in the second grade. And uh, the teacher said, these aren't collectibles, these are toys. And she took my Beatles cards. And so I went back to the store to buy more Beatles cards and there was nothing there except baseball cards. And so I started collecting baseball cards. And by the time I was 19, I had over 100,000 baseball cards. And so a lot of my history, I would learn off the backs of baseball cards. And you know, you love your baseball cards when you start taking photographs with them. And so that's me right there. And you can see, guys, I had a little more hair back then. So it's been a few years here. Uh, but uh, I still collect baseball cards and have I still have a pretty, pretty good collection right now as well. OK, and go to the next slide. And then, of course, uh, when I was writing the thing about some ball players are crowned, some of them were down. I was thinking about uh, Babe Ruth as being crowned. I don't know how much everybody on here knows about Babe Ruth, but. In 1927, he made over $200,000 as his salary. Someone came to Babe and they said, Babe, you know, you made more money than the president. And Babe said, why not? I had a better year. Also, uh, every, ball, every ball player, every kid has a favorite player. 
my favorite player was Dick Allen. And I'm there shaking his hand. Dick Allen died during the pandemic, not from the pandemic, but in the pandemic year 2020. And um, he was an inspiration to me. And I had a chance to meet him. And and I used to act like Dick. And if you ever uh, followed Dick Allen, you know, um, I, he created a lot of controversy on every team. So me trying to be like him, he got me kicked off a few teams trying to be like Dick Allen. And he got a he got a good laugh out of that when I told him a few of the stories. But uh, Dick Allen, the first time he played on AstroTurf in the Houston Astrodome, they asked Dick Allen, he said, how do you like this new AstroTurf? He said, if a horse can't eat it, I don't want to play on it. That was Dick Allen. Go to the next slide. And, of course, uh, this is another guy you want to know about. He was just inducted into the uh, Hall of Fame in Cooperstown, New York. His name is Bud Fowler. And he started the Adrian Page Fence Giants along with um, Grant Homer and Johnson in 1894. And so this is a baseball pioneer, just recently got his recognition as going into the Hall of Fame. But that is a person, once again, who was around Michigan before the turn of the century. And these are some of your great African-American baseball players. So if you're studying anything that has to do with Michigan baseball, you've got to know about Bud Fowler. And, of course, he's in Cooperstown now, so everybody will get a chance to know more about Bud Fowler. Go to the next slide. And uh, here's the team that he helped organize, and that's the Page Finch Giants. And they were just simply an outstanding team um, before the turn of the century. And so they're, they're in the 1890s. They're winning a lot of ball games. And... Uh, they were sponsored by a fence company. So you look at this photograph closely, uh, they're standing on fence. Uh, George Wilson played for them, Pat Patterson played for them, and Bud Fowler. So uh, this was a really good team. And they operated out of Adrian, Michigan. And uh, so, and they traveled by train. And, you know, I grew up around an area in Kansas City, Kansas, not too far from the railroad tracks. And, uh, I hate to say this when kids are on the line, but we used to go down for our recreation, catch a slow freighter, and hop on the train. And uh, But, you know, I don't do that anymore. As a matter of fact, I went down to the rail yard to take a picture, and this train is not moving. My train hopping days are long behind me. So anyway, but in, and in the old days, believe it or not, if you were with some of these uh, African-American teams who were going by the names Giants, if they weren't one of the really famous teams and they were like a local team, sometimes players would have to hop on trains just to get to the next city to uh, catch a ball game and to be able to play. So uh, sometimes players actually had to hobo. And so uh, this picture I took right here symbolizes more than just me hanging onto a train. So we go to the next line. Then, of course, uh, there were some other great ball players I met. James Coupapa Bell. Now, when I was writing this part, and I was thinking about James Coupapa Bell. He was a guy that told me that one time he stole 175 bases in a season. And he said, because they kept leaving the scorebook, he only got credit for 95. Mm -hmm. But uh, I used to wonder before 1980, could a guy really steal 175 bases? Because, of course, no one's ever done that in the big leagues. Well, it turns out that uh, Vince Coleman came along and stole something like 140 bases around 1984. And there was another guy named uh, Billy Hamilton that played for the Minnesota Twins maybe a couple of years ago. When he was in the minor leagues, he stole 150-something bases. So I knew Coupapa Bell was uh, telling the truth. Satchel Page said Coupapa Bell, Bell was so fast, he could turn the lights off and get in the bed before the room got dark. Now, now the first time I heard that, it wasn't Satchel Page saying, it was Muhammad Ali. And Muhammad Ali was saying he was so fast he could turn the lights off and get in the bed before the room got dark. But he didn't invent that. And, you know, it's kind of ironic. Satchel Page was the one who told the story about Cool Papa Bell. But Satchel Page used to also say that age is mind over matter. If you don't mind, it doesn't matter. But he didn't invent that. That came from Mark Twain. So sometimes you have to be careful where you get your quotes from. Go to the next slide. And of course, yeah, I started to talk about some giants making their making it when they were young. And I was thinking about this guy named George Giles. Matter of fact, I will be in his hometown tomorrow. He's a, he was from Manhattan, Kansas, right around Junction City. So I'll be at Fort Riley tomorrow morning at nine o'clock in the morning presenting. 
But uh, George Giles came to the Kansas City Monarchs when he was 16 years old. And they saw that he was a good ball player, but he wasn't ready. So they sent him out to play with one of those Giants teams. And um, But it turns out the team he played for was an all-black team in 1926. And they were called the Kansas City Royals. And a lot of people don't realize that the Kansas City Royals baseball name was originally taken from black baseball teams, the Kansas City Royals. And so that's who he played for in 1926. And he comes up and he's uh, 17 years old playing for the Kansas City Monarchs. But if you ever follow Willie Mays, he came up around 15 and 16 years old. He's 90 something years old right now. Uh, if you ever follow Roy Campanella, he was playing with Negro League professional teams at 15 years old. So these are really good ball players. And uh, those two guys, Willie Mays and Campanella, ended up in the Hall of Fame. George Giles didn't, but he was just an all around great guy. And he had a grandson that played in the big leagues as well, Brian Giles. We'll go to the next slide. And of course, uh, most people haven't heard of this guy named Josh Gibson. Maybe you have if you follow the Negro Leagues. I can tell you a lot of stories about Josh Gibson. But one uh, time there was a baseball player named Jesse Williams. He said they were playing the Homestead Grays, which was Josh's team. And he said uh, he went to the bat rack and he found an old bat that was uh, – had tax in it, was taped up and looked like it was pretty much shattered. And so he went to Josh. He said, Josh, Josh, this must be your old broken back. And Josh Gibson said, I don't break bats. I wear them out. And that was Josh Gibson, reported to have hit over 800 home runs. And he died at age 35 from a brain tumor. These are your great ball players that didn't live long, but they sure live strong. We go to the next slide. And of course, uh, got to talk about Andrew Rue Foster. He's the one that put that Detroit Stars team together and sent Pete Hill to manage it. But he actually played a season in Ostego, Michigan in 1902. It was the only time that he ever played for a mixed team. He originally came out of Texas. And he always believed that Black players ought to stay together and get stronger. And that's why he is the president of the first and lasting Negro National League in 1920. That's Andrew Rue Foster, but he pitched a year in Michigan, believe it or not. So Michigan, I'm, I'm telling you, Michigan has a rich history. We'll go to the next slide. And of course, there's uh, Andrew Rue Foster there, and uh, he is uh, there. Uh, he's the larger guy. He's with uh, C.I. Taylor, uh, the manager of the Indianapolis ABCs. And then there's two guys who, who own newspapers. And I thought I'd mention some of the newspapers because there were black newspapers before the turn of the century in Michigan. And if you ever want to dig deeply, you might want to get a hold to some of these newspapers. Some of them are newspapers online. Some of them, you have to go to the State Historical Society to get copies. But there is a lot of history in those newspapers that has not been told. Not just baseball history, but all kinds of African-American history. And these are just a few. You can see we're going back to 1879 with black newspapers. Next slide. And of course, uh, when the Negro National League started, we, we just said Andrew Ruth Foster was the president. Well, all the players were black, all the owners were black, except for two men. And these two men happened to be from the area I'm from, and they were with the Kansas City Monarchs. So J.L. Wilkinson and Tom Baird. Let me tell you a quick story about each one of those. J.L. Wilkinson, he believed in gender equality in baseball. He believed that girls ought to be playing baseball right along with the men. So the first team he organized was called the Bloomer Girls back in 1907, 1908. And he had uh, all girls team. He had three guys dressed up like girls who used to do the pitching. Now, don't ask me where they went to use the restroom. Did you see how I slide that political statement in there? <laughs> so that's J.L. Wilkinson. He also was the father of night baseball. Uh, believe it or not, in 1930, when he was launching night baseball on these touring trucks that he would take to city to city, um, the American League president, Ben Johnson, said night baseball will never last. It's just a fa passing fad just a passing fad. And J.L. Wilkinson said that lights would be the baseball with talkies or the movies. And of course, the movies had just started talking with Al Josephs, the jazz singer. So we know who was right on that, right? 
that's not Major League Baseball history. That's Negro League Baseball history. And, of course, the other co-owner of the Kansas City Monarchs, a guy by the name of <clears throat> Tom Baird. He liked to go by T.Y. Baird. And the reason he went by T.Y. Baird, because he didn't want people to know his name completely, because his middle name was Younger. So if you put Younger with Kansas and Missouri, what do you get? You get Cole Younger, his family, that rolled with Jesse James, maybe somebody watching Westerns, that kind of thing. So anyway, that was Tom Baird's family. And to top it off, he had more family than that. He had some of his relatives who tried to stage a, a daytime bank robbery in Pittsburgh, Kansas. And they were called the Dalton Gang. And those are all his relatives. And a lot of people don't connect all this history with baseball, but you can. Also, the guy in the middle, his name was Ray L. Dome. Ray L. Dome was out of Muscatine, Iowa. Uh, and by the way, J.L. Wilkinson was from Algona, Iowa. Tom Bear was from Pentagle, Arkansas. Ray L. Dome from Muscatine, Iowa. All of these guys were great promoters. Ray L. Dome sponsored the House of David baseball team. He was their big promoter. And uh, he also invented a thing called donkey baseball. So if you ever see donkey baseball, that's the founder of donkey baseball, the creator. Go to the next slide. And the reason I want to mention the House of David, because they were also from Michigan. They were part of a religious cult that operated out of Benton Harbor, Michigan. And um, their leader was Benjamin Farnell. He said that if you join our community here, you will never die. Of course, he died in 1927. And uh, but that was Benjamin Parnell. And a lot of people gave up everything to go and join the House of David. Once you got to the House of David, you couldn't have any children. So the colony eventually died out. I think there's one person that's still there today. And uh, but the people who run it actually are people who came to the colony and decided to leave and they had children. And so their children come back and run the House of David colony, believe it or not. Uh, of course, King Ben. Uh, Benjamin Parnell, um, they never buried Benjamin Parnell. They put his body in a glass uh, sarcophagus, and he's still inside one of the houses uh, in, on the House of David uh, property there in uh, Benton Harbor. So this is a great team here. I always have to tell young people, these aren't hippies from the 60s. These are actually baseball players from the 1930s, and they didn't cut their hair based on the scripture here. And there's a new documentary just came out uh, called The Bearded Boys of Baseball. And if you ever see that documentary, you'll have to know who I am because I'm the only black guy in it. And I'm probably one of the uh, only black guys who's an expert on the House of David around the country. But uh, you, you might want to get that for the library, too. And there's another one uh, called Life Everlasting. It's called uh, House of David Life Everlasting. And I'm in that one as well. And once again, the only black guy in there. But there's some great historians in that one as well. And it uh, won a Cannes Film Festival Award and also a Bollywood Award for a Best American Documentary. So I'm quite proud because I never thought I would ever get the Cannes Film Festival. It never even entered my mind. <laughs> so, so anyway, but this is history about Michigan that people need to know. And the House of David is one. So go to the next slide. And of course, the House of David had two famous people that you ought to know about. They had a guy by the name of Grover Cleveland Alexander. Now, you'll notice Grover Cleveland Alexander, uh, he would come and he pitched for the House of David, never, never had to grow a beard. He would pitch one inning a night. And after that one inning, he would go sit down. Sometimes he might pitch two innings, but he didn't have to pitch the whole game. And people would flock to see the House of David so they could see Grover Cleveland Alexander. And some nights he couldn't pitch that one inning. And I'll just say this. Uh, he was known to take a nip. And that was Grover Cleveland Alexander. He's in the Baseball Hall of Fame, still holds the National League record to this very day for the most career shutouts in the National League. But he played for the House of David. And some nights, since he couldn't pitch, they needed to have another promotion. So they signed this lady named Babe Ditcherson one of the finest female athletes of the 20th century. She could play professional baseball. She could play, uh, she's actually in the Golf Hall of Fame. She was a professional basketball player and she won 
Olympic gold medals for track. And so this was an outstanding athlete. And she would come and she would pitch one or two innings. They were paying her $1,000 a month during the Depression, which was awfully good money. And she would come pitch one or two innings. And her famous pitch was a spitball. And Burley Grimes, the last player who could throw a spitball legally in the major league, said that her spitball was better than his. So that's Babe Ditcherson. And it's a female athlete that a lot of young people don't know. But both of these people have museums. And the thing about Grover Cleveland Alexander, also, you notice his name, Grover Cleveland. You know, he's named after a president. And there's a movie that came out about him in, in the uh, early 1950s. And uh, Doris Day played his wife. And the guy who played Grover Cleveland was our 40th president, Ronald Reagan. So how about that for a little baseball trivia? Go to the next slide. And of course, uh, when I talk about some of the players who, who got old, but some ball players didn't live to get old. And I just mentioned a few of them here that died in their 20s. Ball players I talk about all the time. And even there's a few other ones uh, that when I was a kid following baseball and a teenager and in my early 20s, there were ball players in the big leagues who were African American ball. We can't hear you, Phil. Okay. Okay. Try to uh, try to unmute yourself. Yeah, it keeps it keeps going back to mute, but that's all right. Okay. All right. So, okay. So yeah, I actually wrote Lyman Bostock, and I have a letter that his a wife sent me on Funeral Home Stationery that's in my collection. So I'm really connected to a lot of these ball players, either talking about them or just taking time to write them a letter. And uh, one of my books I wrote, and by the way, I'm on my 10th book, but I wrote a book about Dizzy Dean and it was called The Dizzy and Daffy Dean Barnstorming Tour, Race, Media, and America's Pastime. And I was able to talk about Dizzy Dean. And a lot of people have heard about Dizzy Dean. Dizzy Dean in 1934, he played against uh, four great Negro League teams in a, about 12 games. And after those games, they asked him, they said, Dizzy, who's the greatest pitcher you ever saw? And they figured he'd be talking about himself because he usually talked about himself. But he said the greatest pitcher he ever saw was a color boy named Satchel Page. He said, if you could get him and me on the same team, we could win the pennant by the 4th of July and go fishing to the World Series starts. And uh, he believed in Satchel Page because he knew he had seen something that he didn't see in the big leagues. And of course, I have a picture of his wife there. And his wife used to tell the story that they met on one night. The next night they went on their first date. The next night he asked her to marry him. The next day they got married. And she said, when I tell people that, they think I'm dizzy too. So that's dizzy ding, okay? So, and that building in the background, it still stands. That is where the first Negro National League was organized. And that's in Kansas City, Missouri right now. So it's a building you can visit. So we'll go to the next slide. And then of course, uh, this satchel page here, uh, you know, when I was talking about ball players still playing past their prime, age 40, throwing baseballs over dimes, I was thinking about Satchel Page. You know, Satchel Page holds the record for being the major's oldest rookie. He was 42 years old when he uh, joined the Cleveland Indians in 1947. And so that's the oldest rookie in baseball history. And the only way you can top being the oldest rookie is you got to come back to be the oldest player. So in 1965, he came back at age 59, pitched three innings against the Boston Red Sox, struck out one batter, a pitcher by the name of Bill Mumblekent, and then he gave up a double to a Hall of Famer by the name of Carl Yastrzemski. And uh, I know those names well because I collected baseball cards. And so anyway, that was Satchel Page. And if you're ever in Kansas City, where he's buried, there's a little poetic saying on the back of his monument and I'm the one who wrote that. I didn't make one mistake, though. I didn't put my name on it, so nobody knows that I wrote it. But I did, and uh, I'm honored today to be on the uh, be a member of the Satchel Page uh, Family Foundation. So go to the next slide. 
And of course, uh, when I was talking about nicknames, I was thinking about this guy, Turkey Stearns. Turkey Stearns uh, died in Detroit, Michigan. And he was originally from Montgomery, Alabama. And when he first came up, you know, back in those days, the way you got your nickname was it would be a couple of old veteran guys, a few veteran guys. They sit on the bench. They watch the young guys come in. So they watch how you ate. They knew where you came from. They watch how you dress, how you talk. They looked at you, and that's how you got your nickname because they're always sizing you up. Well, this guy came out, Turkey Stern, and he was uh, what they call uh, chasing after fly balls, shagging fly balls. And one of the old guys said, look at that guy run. He runs with his chest stuck out. And the other guy said, he looks like a turkey. And he said, yep, that's a good name. We're going to call him Turkey Stearns. And Turkey Stearns is in the Hall of Fame today, is Turkey Stearns. And uh, they just celebrated him last year. I was there at that event at, in the Detroit Major League Stadium. So Turkey Stearns, an outstanding player, but well-connected to Michigan. Go to the next slide. And then, of course, along the way, I would pick up little pictures and these pictures came out of ball player scrapbook. Uh, one of them is this Grand Cafe there. Um, I was speaking at Claremont, Oklahoma, and I pulled this uh, picture out. And it was on my slide. There was a black guy there who was about 89 years old. He said those signs used to be all up and down the highway. He said, I had forgotten all about them until I saw it in your presentation. And uh, But he remembered those signs. The ball players saw these signs and they thought it was so odd that they got out and took a picture underneath it and they ended up in their scrapbook and now it ends up into my uh, presentation. Also, in the other picture, it looks like these ball players went fishing. Well, actually, they were in the bus and they were going past some river and they saw all the fish jumping out. So someone said, stop the bus and they got baseball bats and they went out and went fishing with baseball bats and all those fish were caught with baseball bats. And so these guys, yeah, they had had it tough sometime, but they also had fun as well. And so that was life on the road, living away from home. Go to the next slide. And we're almost finished here. I'm kind of getting down to the last few slides. And then, of course, I can't hardly go anywhere without talking about Wilbur Buller Rogan, who I happen to think is the greatest all-around baseball player that ever lived. And I've written a book exclusively on him called Wilbur Ro Bullet Rogan and the Kansas City Monarchs. But Bullet Rogan, when I first started talking about Bullet Rogan, I was talking about him being the greatest all-around baseball player that ever lived. People didn't believe me because they were talking about a white guy named Babe Ruth who could pitch and hit. But Rogan could pitch and hit too. So how would Rogan be better than Ruth? And here's, here's my story. Bullet Rogan is a starting pitcher, won over 400 games. Babe Ruth never won over 400 games as a pitcher. Bullet Rogan would hit home runs. I found over 400 home runs that he hit. Of course, Babe Ruth hit 714 in the big leagues, so he hit more home runs. But how about this? Babe Ruth was six foot two. Rogan was five foot seven and a half. And many times Rogan would hit a home run. Pitch a shutout, practically win his own baseball game. He was also a 300 hitter in every league he ever played in. And, of course, we know Babe Ruth struck out nearly 2,000 times. So Bill Rogan was probably a better hitter than Babe Ruth when he came to making contact. Also, Bullet Rogan was a 10-second man, which means he could run the 100-yard dash in just under 10 seconds. Now, somebody knows that, Bullet, that Babe Ruth couldn't do that. Somebody knows that. It, that's Wilbur Bullet Rogan. And so I happen to like him as the greatest all-around baseball player that ever lived. And right now you have a guy named Shawnee Otani that's over uh, with the Dodgers who's making quite a, a name for himself as an all-around baseball player. But he's got a few years to go before he can catch up with Rogan. And if that's not enough for you, how about this? Rogan also drove the bus, guys. So, And then he was married to a farm girl from Cocker City, Kansas. That's where she was born. And if you ever get out to Kansas way, Cocker City has one of the most unique exhibits you ever want to see. And when I'm in Kansas, I ask people, have they ever been there? And they say, yes, because they have the world's largest ball of twine. Not the most exciting exhibit that I've ever seen, but I've been there. So anyway, her name was Catherine. The interesting thing about Catherine, I look at this picture and I say to myself, I would hate to be sitting behind her in church. Let me go to the next slide. 
And uh, of course, uh, a few years ago, I put out a book about John Buck O'Neill. And uh, uh, in it, I used QR codes. It was the first time in a sports book that anyone had ever used QR codes. You can stand these, scan the QR codes and you can hear me interviewing Buck O'Neill in 1986, one of the earliest interviews that you'll ever hear on Buck O'Neill, even though there's lots of interviews that came after. And so anyway, that's John Buck O'Neill and that's my wife there, August 13th, that's me there. And that's my son there who is a uh, college professor now, and he's six foot four, so he's taller than Buck, and Buck was six foot two in his prime. So that's always one of my favorite pictures, but that book was called John Buck O'Neill, The Rookie, His Words, His Voice, and you can actually hear his voice in a book. And uh, I encourage people to look at this kind of technology because it's a way you can capture your own family history. And so uh, this is the kind of things we're doing, and that book has 11 QR codes, and believe me, I've sold a lot of that book when I go around and people get a chance to hear. So we go to the next slide. All right, then. So that kind of gives you just an idea, uninterrupted, of some of the things that we could talk about related to Michigan baseball. And so I want to end with another point. It's a little shorter point, but it kind of summarized some of the things that we talked about. And then I'll open it up if that's okay. And anyone has yes. any questions, you can give your questions and we'll go from there. So the poem, uh, this one is called uh, The Stars That Did Not Shine. And it goes something like this. My name is uh, James Coopapa Bell. My name is Chet Brewer, but my age is way beyond. I spend my prime in baseball shoes, but my sporting days are gone. Not I'm just one more forgotten face among the black face teams and old dark horse that came the course they called the Negro Leagues. Not I worked the fields in Tennessee, but I dreamed of better days. So I left the plow, the picking bag to join the homestead grays. And all summer long, we played the states then headed south for fall. Through rain and dust, we rode the bus so we could play baseball. And we played for love and we played for pride and we still made much more. The bread, the beans, the hotel bugs, the roads where crowds don't roam. The all night rise, the seedy side came with the life I chose, but we made do and we came through because darn it. We were pros. Now we played in the shadow of the big Lou Gehrig and the rest, then stayed outside that big league things why they were called the best. But we played them well and we gave them hell with every hit and pitch, then stay behind that color line and watch those boys get rich. But did they see Josh Gibson swing or Satchel throw his stuff? Or can you imagine how bad it feels when your best is not good enough? When clouds roll in across the sky to hide the brightest moon, is then you'll find some stars don't shine. Some folks were born too soon. So God bless you, Jackie Robinson, Willie Mays and all. You wore our numbers on your backs when you played big league ball. And every time you hit one out, slid or laid one down, you carried us from that old bus to the halls of Cooperstown. Now, my name is Norman Turkey Stern. My name is John Buck O'Neill. My name is Bud Fowler, but you might not remember that. I'm just one more along the score who played with ball and bat. But everyone, when you seek out heroes and you praise this great pastime, remember oh, those old brown faced pros, the stars that did not shine. Thank you. Let's open up for some questions. And then I just want to thank you. I, I had a good time tonight. Hopefully you did too. All right. Uh, you can put your questions into the chat and I'll go to the chat. And also, if you want to ask your question directly, um, Michael, will they be able to unmute themselves or will you? Um, will I have to will I have to uh, unmute them? Yes, they should be able to unmute themselves. OK, so if you have a question, you can unmute and then you can ask Phil your question directly. Um, Mike B says, thank you for the presentation. I believe the greatest mistake of Bud Selig's tenure was to not ensure that Buck O'Neill was inducted into the Hall of Fame while he was alive to be celebrated. Do you have any insight on why such a mistake was made for a man that spent his life advocating uh, for remembering this important story in our history? Yeah, oh, well, I remember that day. Uh... Uh, that day, uh, I was doing color commentary for a cable TV station. And uh, I had tried to get on the committee, but every time I tried to get in there to vote, something would happen. They said, oh, well, this person already voted. So anyway, I couldn't get on. it. So, um, so um, they picked the people they wanted to be on the committee. And so 
that when Buck O'Neill was not elected, now keep in mind, I can see the M Negro Leagues Museum out of one monitor. I can see the people who were voting. I think I forget where they were, but I could see them in the other monitor. And so, and then, so when he didn't get in, the first thing I said, I'm glad they didn't put me on that committee. <laughs> so, but, but yeah, he should have gotten in. And because he got into in 2022. Now, what's interesting is I was on the group who selected the ballot for who was going to be voting in 2022. And so I helped put the ballot together and Buck, uh, Bud Fowler was on there. So it was some more good ball players. John Donaldson was on there. He should have gotten in. Uh, and, but I, I wasn't a voting member. They didn't allow me to vote again. So I helped them put the ballot together. And one thing for certain, if they had to let me vote, Dick Allen would have got to vote. He would be in the day too. So, so I understand a buck on there should have gotten in and, and it would have been nice to uh, be able to uh, drink the coffee while you're alive. But uh, I think somewhere out there in the great beyond, he's smiling. <laughs> Okay. Um, Harold and Phyllis, um, my brother and sister-in-law, they uh, live in Jacksonville, Florida. Uh, they want to thank you for the oh, presentation. Yeah. And did any of the Michigan players play against the Jacksonville Red Caps? Oh, all the time. Matter of fact, I don't know. Uh, uh, Buck O'Neill went to college in Jacksonville, Edward Waters College. Oh. Yeah, yeah he was out of Sarasota, uh, Florida. And I wrote about that in my book. Uh, but yeah, the Jacksonville Red Caps, uh, they were in the Negro Leagues toward the uh, end of the 1938 season. They played a few games. Uh, so, yeah, most definitely. And uh, some good ball players came out of Florida. Uh, my most recent book uh, about the 1910 uh, Chicago Leland Giants, I talk about uh, uh, Don Henry Lloyd. He was out of Florida. So, yeah, Florida Florida was a good – I mean, when I think of where, where the most African-American ball players came from, I'm going to say Florida and Texas probably lead the pack. Uh, is there a website for Negro League merchandise? Uh, not one specifically. Now, I do have a site myself that you can go out uh, where you can you can pick up my books. And a lot of people pick my books up there because I will autograph them from there. But my website is NLB, like Negro League Baseball. So it's NLBalive.com nlbalive.com and then if you follow me on twitter x x twitter x uh, i'm known as uh at negro league man and uh i've got quite a few followers over here some pretty dedicated follow followers and i used to put up a like a um uh, a baseball fact a day uh or two or three a day and i've been doing that since 2010 so you can follow those and you will learn a lot because I'm constantly digging for 44 years. And um, like I said, I'm on my 10th book. And uh, my last two books have won uh, local uh, historical society awards. One of them in Illinois, one of them in Missouri. And of course, I have a, a what they call a Society of American Baseball Research Award, as well as a uh, spitball award for the best baseball book in 1992. And you think about that, guys. Man, that's 30 years ago. I'm still here. <laughs> so, and and look and people are just now meeting me for the first time so that's great but mm -hmm. but uh it's been it's been an exciting run okay um rich s um says great presentation and thank you and does the northville district library have any of phil's books yes we do we have um two of his selections um the dizzy dean and we also have uh the one on uh, buck o'neill so and if there are others that uh, are out there, and the, uh, we can certainly order them and get copies in the library for you to check out, as well as those two movies that you mentioned. Those sound very interesting on the um, um, the the cult. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the house, the house of David, and it, it's a it's a really good story about life in Michigan. And then also, uh, there is a place uh, called Idlewild. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. The, the guy who put the most money behind Idlewild to get his started was a guy named Beauregard Mosley. And Beauregard Mosley was the owner of the Chicago Leland Giants in 1910 and 1911. And I've written probably the 
the, the most intense biography, bio of him, not biography, but bio on him in my book about the Chicago Leland Giants. But he died in 1919 mm -hmm. uh, from from uh, the pandemic. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but another person with great tentacles from Chicago into Michigan. And, uh, and people don't talk about these people enough. So it's kind of my job to, I've kind of made myself a person who wants to keep their history alive as long as I can. And we thank you for that too. That's, that's really great. And we all need to know this history, you know. Mm -hmm. okay. Any other questions, comments? You can unmute yourself at this time. We're just about wrapping up, so. Okay, I do want to thank you, you know, uh, for finding me, right, and getting me to be a part of this. Uh, I, I like that name, that last name you have there. Oh, yeah. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> it belonged to my ex-husband, but <laughs> it's a good name. <laughs> I <laughs> asked me if we were related, and, and then, I said, no, we're not. <laughs> I, don't, I, don't I had somebody ask me that today, too. So, uh -huh. And then also, I want to thank Michael, you know, for, for all you did to make this uh, a smooth uh, presentation tonight and just thank the library mm -hmm. and you guys keep up the good work and maybe I'll come back next year. Absolutely. Don't forget about me. I and, won't. Uh, maybe mm -hmm. one of these days I'll get to actually be in the library. You're right. And um, I've never, you know, a couple of years ago I did a 200 city tour. You can imagine mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I drove everywhere that I went, 17 states. It took me four years to complete the tour. Wow. And uh, but I did not make it to Michigan. Mm -hmm. So uh, so hopefully uh. Next time around, I'm not doing any more 200 city tours. I think oh, that's a lot. That was, yeah, that was rough. Yeah, but it was fun. I, I yeah. met a lot of people, learned a lot more, and mm -hmm. now, of course, coming off of that tour, I wrote the Dizzy and Daffy Dean barnstorming book because mm -hmm. I had a new experience of living like the ball players did, mm -hmm. traveling from city to city. So, so that's about all I had, guys. Okay, all right. Yeah, so I'm on the road again tomorrow. Uh, okay. I'll be down uh, at Fort Riley, and uh, I'll be talking to military attorneys. Those are guys that handle court martials for people who act up in the military. Oh, <laughs> so, okay. So I'll be talking about uh, the black, uh, actually, baseball and civil rights. Okay. <laughs> so we're going to start off with Frederick Douglass tomorrow, and we're going to roll right into Kirk Flood. Oh, okay. Wow. Well, they, we may, we definitely have to uh, uh, have you back for some of that. And we'll, Harold Phyllis put in, uh, if in Jacks, give us a shout out. <laughs> Who was that? Um, Harold and Phyllis Davis, if in Jacksonville, give them a shout out. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, you, we can, get, do you that. can get in touch through, um, in touch with them through me. I know where they live. <laughs> okay. All yeah. right. And then Tell them to follow me. If, you know, if you're on Facebook, I'm at Phil S. Dixon. That makes it easy to find me. There's too many Phil Dixons out there. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, and then of course, uh, on X, if you you know if you're there, and I'm on Instagram too, Phil Dixon. So I'm pretty easy to find. And then of course, mm -hmm. you can follow me on my website too. So, uh, but I, hopefully, I get to Jackson. I've never been there. Never been there. Okay. So well, all right. And is next time you're in in Michigan, if you're at Comerica Park whatever, you know, doing some type of presentation for, you know, a, a tribute to Negro League Baseball. Yeah, maybe we can have you come back into the library in person. But yeah, we'll, definitely, right. reach, we'll, definitely, well like definitely reach out for, for other programs. I'm really interested right. in that House of David. <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay. That's an, ex an excellent mm -hmm. topic. Yeah. Okay. Excellent. All right. Well, thank you so much, Phil, and thank you, um, viewers, uh, for um, just checking out the program and hanging in there with us through everything that we've been through to bring this presentation to you. All right. Thanks again, Phil. Thanks Thank you. Back. You have a nice night. All right. You too. All right. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone. Bye.